Welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? That's the new music. That is from a incredible musician in Wisconsin, Greg Gilbertson and his band, bringing us new music. You'll hear it a lot now. I can't wait. Welcome to Watar. You know what? Last time we were talking about white juju. Today we're talking about white juju. Last week we talked about what happens in Appalachia and various other places when white juju crosses the ocean, right? The earliest settlers brought over some white juju. Go back and listen last week. They would take someone's name, write it on a piece of paper, wrap it up and drill a hole in a tree and then put that name in that tree and then put a little plug in there so that no one could get in there. And then they would hit that plug, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And then that would put a spell on whosoever name was wedged into that oak tree. Yeah, I'm giving you experiences that are very similar to the ones I told you about last week. Right? Which one, like when we trim our beard, if we're working in Sierra Leone, little kids will come get it and they'll give it back to you if they're nice or they'll take it to the juju doctor. And they'll put a, you know, say prayers over it. Put a spell on you, good or bad, I don't know. This is the conversation we had last week. Now I want to try to pick it up where we left off. So what is white juju? It's the culture of not science. It's experiencing those stories is like trying to take a little pill that takes us to a time capsule that takes us to, I don't know, pre-enlightenment history. So how did we get where we are? Well, last week I said it starts with Barlam and Gregory Palamas. We're not going to go deep on this. I highly recommend you go click the links. But fundamentally, St. Gregory, right? He is a Orthodox monk, theologian, who's arguing that you can commune with God. Not with some created grace, but actually with God in his energies. Barlam, who's an Athenite monk in the Orthodox tradition, is uncomfortable with this kind of language. He's arguing that that leads you down a type of Pelagian model, where you can save yourself somehow, where you can become like God in a way that's unacceptable. You can become powerful enough to unite yourself to God and become like a God. It's uncomfortable for him. And you can hear all the arguments right in this argument that lead to a division, right? You get the Catholic, well, what happens is, is Barlam and Palamas have this big argument, this very public argument, and Barlam basically becomes a, a Western Christian. He goes and puts himself under the Pope. And the important point being made here in this very important argument that I highly recommend you go and read about is that while God is unknowable in his essence, he can be known, experienced in his energies. And such an experience changes neither who or what God is, nor who or what you are, the one experiencing God is. Palamas argues like a plant does not become the sun simply because it soaks up its light and warmth nor does a person soak up the warmth and light. Who, nor does a person who soaks up the warmth and light of God, nor do they ever spiritually become God. They become like God, filled with his energies. Barlam had some problems with this. And so basically from about the 1100s AD until the 18th century, the Christian world in the West and in the East, well, they were in a weird back and forth between things highly ordered and systematic, rational and mathematical, and this wildly spiritually, I don't know, creative, chaotic world that we heard from last week with white juju and people burning people from far away with blood milk. And my favorite from last week was when the Appalachian lady saw one of the witches milk an axe handle. That's hot. Yeah, that kind of world. There was a division that happened. 
And well, I want to get into it a little bit. One of the things that you start to see in the West that tells you that they're heading toward the rational point of view is the Inquisition. Now, that's a big story to tell. We're not going to tell it all right here. But the, the key to the Inquisition is, in, in history, you need to realize it's not so much a persecution, although that happened, as it's the adaptation and adoption of a process. Okay? The process was one ground in a rational trial-like procession of questions held by rational inquirers whose goal was to suss out the truth. Yeah. So I don't want to get into the truth, okay? There's all these periods of the Inquisition. It's a long time. The Inquisition is like 400 years. The Inquisition is a series of adaptations in the West that are trying to get at spiritual truth through a very rational, legal-like process. And this process lasted from the middle 1100s till the 1800s. And this is essentially, it's the building of Babylon. I said it. Babylon, rationalistic, will fix everything, will legally suss it out. It becomes a process. The Inquisition is bad, yes, because you read about it from some people who were like woke and they told you how bad it was. It's bad, but it's not what you think. It's the institutionalization of the rational experience. It's an attempt to take the rational and make it, I don't know, and inject it into all aspects of theology, theos, God, which is probably not a great, probably put the music on that. You go, warning, Will Robinson, that's bad. It's not good. Anyway, the scholastic theologians like Peter Abelard and Thomas Aquinas, they called this process, eventually they called it the sacred science. I didn't make that up. Or sometimes they call it sacred doctrine is science. <clears throat> that's systematic theology. Right? Aquinas sort of starts with natural theology. It's a type of Aristotelian mechanistic theology. It kind of tests tradition. It kind of tries to suss out the truth when it comes to these bones that are supposedly like healing people. He wants to put a he wants to put a systematic sort of I don't know. He wants to put a test to these these spiritually scary things. These 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 chaotic happenings in the world. Aquinas is like, well, let's test them. Then we Barlam, who we just talked about. And then you get lots of challenges to the papacy, right? You get Calvin who's challenging the papacy and some of the systematic theology. Luther challenges it because it's become a little too tight. It's too tight. Zing Zwingli, right? Lots of big books with rational arguments. Then with, I don't know, people saying stuff about Jesus's blood and the elect and a lot of rational explanations for who's saved. And then something really interesting happens. Do you want to know what happens? In Europe and here in the United States, a whole group of people go the other way. As the West got more and more rationalistic, you started to see these great awakenings. Especially in America, it happened twice. Well, it started in Europe, happened in America, and then it happened again in America. People get nuts. They get like super right brain kind of nuts, right? The right brain's the left brain. Right. They get the chaotic, creative, right? That kind of way. They get, here's my phrase, I would like everyone to use it. You don't have to pay, but you can use it, and I'm going to give it to you for free. They get Pentecostaholic. Yeah. There is a rejection of this 200, 300 years of rational theology, and people get Pentecostaholic in the West. You can say it. You can use it right now. You could turn to a friend, say, hey, man, don't be so Pentecostaholic. See, you see a rise, a serious rise in mystical utopian visions. People like the Rappites, named after George Rapp. By the way, 
you don't want a group of people coming together and practicing religious stuff, ecstasies called the rapites. So I'm going with George Rapp and the rapites. I'm not making this up. Okay. The rapites encourage celibacy and adhere to the socialist principles of holding all good things in common. This was a mystical movement, early 1800s. There's the Shakers, founded by Anne Lee. Uh, she called herself the Mother of Christ. Yikes! That was a thing. They didn't have sex. They were monastic, and they died out. Yeah, go up to Massachusetts. You can see where they used to live. I, th I think there might be a shaker around, to, uh, shaker or two around these days. I don't think so, actually. Then we get one of my faves, John Noyes, yeah, who who was convinced, and he started a commune. He was convinced that he became he had become perfect. Yeah, he called his idea, and here here's here here's a creative thing. He called his idea perfectionism. And one of the perfect things he liked to do is find other perfect people like him and then have communal sex. Like together, the perfect people all getting busy because they're perfect. Yeah. But he didn't call it just, you know, wanting sex. He called it complex marriage. And that seems like a good name for it. I'm not blaming upstate New York for this. But isn't it interesting that there was this whole movement in history, guys? Follow me along with this history thing. There's a whole movement. And it's trying to get away from the rationalist theology of, you know, Barlam and his peeps. And it's heading the other direction. You get Ralph Waldo Emerson, you get Brooks Farm, New Harmony in Indiana. They actually bought land from the rapites. Okay. Rapites. You get the point. There's a lot of stuff flying around in the Second Great Awakening. And basically, that's happening in the United States because, because the math can't hold. The math, the math, it doesn't excite the erotic bowels, it doesn't move you. Well, let's put it this way. For some, it's an ecstatic thing, doing math. But for many, it only scratches the surface of ecstasy. I'm one of those. So you see what's going on, okay? There's a kind of reaction to the systematic. A kind of competition is going on. Left and right, order and chaos, math and art. You get two kinds of Christian emphasis alongside the Catholic emphasis on the systematic. And eventually, through a type of battle in the West, you get the ascent of the materialist mindset. You get a winner. And we have a winner. And that winner walks and talks and smells like me and you, like the me and you we grew up with. And it doesn't talk and walk and smell very much like those Appalachian folks that we've been listening to. And the fundamental a priori manifestation of this victory, the thing that is born out of this left-right swinging theology known as Western Christianity is the New York State Buffalo Normal School. That's right. The winner who we're going to learn about next week, is the New York State Buffalo Normal School, the very first public school in the United States. That's right. This is the place where they're all going to say, Woo, I'm tired. Let's just be secular. That's for next week. Play us out, Greg. Listen to that. It's so good. Let it jam, Andrew. Watar, see you next week, www.first-things.org. Find out what we do, and then come do it with us. We could use you in the field. God bless. Peace out. Au revoir, nakfamdis. Bye-bye.